Okay, hello everyone. This is the CircuitPython Weekly for Monday, April 4th, 2022. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Dan, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. You might ask, what is CircuitPython? It's a version of Python designed to run on tidy computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware on Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join that server anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. Pacific Time, except when it coincides with the U U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar application. We also send app notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you would like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the at sign CircuitPythonistas Discord role. As we said, there's a notes doc to accompany the meeting and recording. The notes doc contains timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to view only the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 60 to 90 minutes, so this gives you an option to skip around. After each meeting, we post the link for the next meeting's notes to the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pinned messages, that's the push pin image at the top of the channel, so that you can add your notes to the following meeting. If you wish to participate but cannot attend, you can write up hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. The meeting is held in five parts. The first is community news, where we go over things that have to do with CircuitPython and Python and other things about Python and microcontrollers. The second part is the state of CircuitPython libraries and Blinkas. In Blinka, this is a statistical overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from what we're all up to. The third part is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. The fourth part of the meeting is Status Updates. Status Updates is an opportunity to sync up on what we've been up to. Take a couple of minutes and talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting and what you'll be up to over the next week until the next meeting. This can be CircuitPython related or if you find that you're not doing a lot of CircuitPython work because you're renovating your kitchen, you could tell us that too. The fifth part is in the weeds. In the weeds is an opportunity for more long form discussions. These discussions can come out of status updates or be something you've identified ahead of time as too long to discuss in status updates. So that's how the meeting will go. Um, so I'll start with community news and take his timestamp. And as I mentioned, this news uh, comes from um, the circuit, the Python and microcontrollers newsletter, which will come out tomorrow. Um, we've just taken out some of the most interesting items that are relevant to CircuitPython from that newsletter. So I just want to note uh, two new versions of CircuitPython came out last week, CircuitPython 7.2.4, which is a new stable release, and CircuitPython 7.3.0-beta.0, which um, is the first of the 7.3 series that we made a release for, and so that we don't have to keep telling people to find absolute newest, newest from, the, um, from the S3 buckets. Uh, as Anne uh, reminds us, subscribe to the circuit to the Python or Microcontrollers newsletter by going to adafruitdaily.com. Uh, in 7.2.4, uh, we fixed an I2C uh, power default uh, thing on the Feather ESP32 S2. That board was revised recently, and the new fix. Uh, enables the I2C power to be on by default for both the old and the new versions of the board. And we also fixed the supervisor.reload function, which stopped working. And 7.3.0, uh, 
uh, the most interesting features to look at are experimental MDNS support. That means you can do things like find your board by typing circuitpython.local in the web browser. Um, some debugging help, uh, hardware debugging help on a couple of boards, several boards, and some initial experimental USB host support. And also we merged changes upstream for MicroPython 1.18, which includes fixes and a few new features. Um, we've got two other, three other interesting news items. Um, I won't read this whole item, but Evan Upton, who's uh, head of Raspberry Pi or the founder of Raspberry Pi, discussed uh, supply issues for Raspberry Pi. As you know, if you tried to buy a Raspberry Pi, they're really hard to get, and they get sold out quickly. And the article that's a link in here um, is a good way for you to find out um, like what's going on and what Raspberry Pi is trying to do to ameliorate the situation. Um, Evan recommends that you buy from authorized resellers. Um, uh, don't be, uh, don't try buy a bunch and resell them on eBay. That's no good for every, anybody except that one person to make a lot of money. And we really discovered that. And uh, you should be able to get them if you keep trying. And they hope to uh, keep working on this problem. So read that article. It's very, very interesting and helpful. Um, we've, the next article is about Adafruit.io. Uh, we've reached a milestone. Adafruit.io is now storing over 1 billion uh, data records. And the interesting thing about this is that in free accounts, most of that, uh, the data in free accounts is deleted after 30 days. So this means that we have a lot of free accounts and we also have a lot of people who are paying and they're keeping their data around. That's very interesting. Um, you could read more details in the, new, in the, uh, in the uh, document. Um, and finally, there's some interesting stuff that you can now use Markdown, the Markdown uh, markup language in Google Docs on the web. You have to enable it by selecting automatically detect Markdown from tools, the tools preferences menu. And then it will notice that and you can um, use various features of Markdown, not all of them, but you can use uh, bulleted lists. You can use headings, italic and bold strike through and links and they will be expanded correctly. So take a look at that. It's a nice new feature in Google Docs. All right, I'll take another timestamp since that's where we are so far. Um, I'll just uh, re remind you the CircuitPython weekly newsletter is a CircuitPython community run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are at adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest Python and hardware related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. Uh, you could, we'd love it if you contribute to this newsletter. You can do that by submitting a pull request to the, in, on GitHub to Adafruit slash CircuitPython dash weekly dash newsletter. You can also uh, contact us on Twitter with the CircuitPython hashtag or you can email cpnews at adafruit.com. Any of those are fine ways to get stuff into the newsletter. We always appreciate contributions. So uh, we'll move on to the next section now, which is the state of CircuitPython library and Blinka. Libraries and Blinka, I'll take another time code. Um, overall, in the past week, there were 44 pull requests merged. Um, 19, there were 19 authors of those pull requests. Uh, I noticed a new user, uh, Byte Evil, uh, who, I, who may or may not have uh, uh, contributed before. Also, maybe W.R. Daigle and C. Hemingway are unfamiliar to me, but I'm not sure. There were 12 reviewers of those 44 pull requests, and there were 18 closed issues closed by 10 people and 21 issues opened by 15 people. So relatively stable, we're kind of still kind of keeping up. Um, Jeff, would you like to do the core part of CircuitPython? Oh, sure, I suppose I can. Uh, in the core, our numbers were 11 pull requests merged from eight authors, 
And uh, in this list, I don't recognize E-R-O-N-G-D. So uh, thanks for your contribution. And we had three reviewers, including one by Scott. Um, maybe that was one he'd reviewed before going on leave and was merged subsequently. I'm not sure. Uh, as far as pull requests, we have 12 open, including several that are over 100 days. But I think those are in draft and uh, are waiting work by the submitters before they move forward. Issues wise, we were the source of the additional issues with three closed by three people and nine opened by five people, leaving us with 519 open issues. Uh, as far as the work Adafruit does on CircuitPython, we prioritize those in the core with uh, milestones. So um, the number of milestones for 7.2.x, we have two open issues. For 7.3.0, we have four open issues. For 7xx, we have 24 open issues. And the rest are things that will be addressed um, on a longer time scale. Particularly when it comes to the long-term issues, um, that doesn't mean that we don't hope someone will work on them. That means Adafruit isn't prioritizing that work right now. So if you want to help out, um, you can take a look at those long-term issues and pick something that is going to be meaningful to you to implement or fix. Um, and also, we've got eight issues not assigned a milestone. I was going through some of those earlier, um, but I'm a little bit timid about assigning milestones, so I didn't finish it up. Anyway, uh, as far as narrative about the core, uh, Dan has really covered what uh, we've been up to in terms of releases already earlier in community news. So I don't need, know that I need to expand on that. More or less, we are in a phase of trying to make the software more stable rather than staking out uh, grand new features. And that'll probably continue um, for, for the, the moment. And yeah, that's what we got for the core. Thank you. OK, thank you, Jeff. And I'll just note that some of the issues that are hanging out, some of the pull requests that are hanging out right now are um, they await uh, merging in, a in 8.0.0 because they uh, break backward compatibility. So that's why some of them are so old. And it's perfectly fine that they're there. It's just not obvious. So it's Right. Not, Thank you, Dan. I'd forgotten that. Yeah. That's, so it's not, it's not terrible that we haven't merged those. We're not. We're just waiting. Um, okay, let's move on to libraries now. So, um, Katni, that's uh, your bailiwick. Go ahead. Thanks, Dan. So this applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that begins with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as a few extras. Uh, across all of those repos, we had 31 pull requests merged by nine authors and 10 reviewers. Um, in terms of merged pull requests, three of them were over uh, a week old, um, and the rest of them were all very recent, uh, which is good because it means we're keeping up with older PRs, but also keeping up with all the new ones. Uh, that leaves us with 26 open pull requests, and um, the oldest is 552 days old. I know we're still working through um, some of those, and uh, some folks are just slowly contributing, and we want to you know, enable folks to do that. Um, where it's not, where it's happening, so that's part of why um, some older PRs are still open. Uh, we had 11 issues closed by seven people and nine opened by eight people, leaving us with 620 open issues, and 199 of those are good first issues. If you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more. If you're interested in reviewing, check out the open pull requests. Uh, take a look for a syntax, so on. If you have the hardware, test it. Leave a comment and let us know. It's always super helpful. And when you're comfortable with that, we can talk about upgrading you to the review team. Um, if you're interested in contributing uh, Python code or documentation, check out um, the open issues. Uh, if you're new to everything, the good first issues are a great place to start. Um, and there's also a guide to contributing uh, to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub available, and we're always on Discord to help out. So don't be intimidated by any of that. Uh, we will enable you to be able to contribute in a way that works for you. In terms of library updates in the last seven days, we had one new library, TSC 2007, and a huge list of updated libraries that I removed from the notes document because it was too much. Um, but I did link to the library report where we get this information every week. And so if you're interested in that list, you can <clears throat> check out uh, the actual report. Um, in terms of library stuff, one of the key things we're doing right now is 
uh, shoring up the library infrastructure setup. Um, we have a, come up with fixes to our CI and to various other um, infrastructure files in the libraries, but we've been bad about adding it to cookie cutter, which means new libraries aren't getting those updates. And we've been bad about adding it to all the libraries, which means not every library is the same where it should be. And um, early hug report to Tech Trick for going through all the libraries and figuring out where the changes are and what differences there are and where we need to make changes either to cookie cutter or by patching the libraries. Um, so I'm really happy to see that we're doing that because um, it's definitely something that we should have kept even all along, but it's, you know, it's a lot of work. So um, I understand why we didn't always get to it. Um, so that's something that we're in the middle of doing, and I hope to see that uh, finished up relatively soon. That's what I've got. Okay, thank you, Kadney. Okay, uh, next section is a report about uh, Blinka, which is a compatibility layer for CircuitPython on single board computers like Raspberry Pi. So you can use it to write, to run CircuitPython code, not in CircuitPython, but to use CircuitPython code and libraries. Uh, Melissa, can you go ahead and read the Belinka section? Uh, sure. Uh, as Dan mentioned, it's for uh, our compatibility layer. It also works on MicroPython. And uh, this week we had two pull requests merged by two authors and two reviewers. Uh, that leaves six open pull requests amongst other repositories. There were four closed issues by two people and three open by three people, leaving a net of 73 open issues. We had 13,442 Pie Wheels downloads in the last month, and we are now up to 88 supported boards. And that's it. Okay, thank you, Melissa. Okay, the next major section is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. Um, we each take turns doing this. I'll start uh, to sort of set the trend, and then we go down the list, which is mostly in alphabetical order usually. Um, so I'll take a time code here. Um, so I, I didn't have a chance to really be thorough about this, but I'd like to thank uh, Jeff for doing a lot of reviews and um, coordination with me on reviews and PRs while Scott is out. So now there are two of us instead of three of us doing a lot of core stuff right now. So thank you, Jeff. OK, C. Grover uh, is not is text only today, so I'll read their contributions. Um, thanks to Foamy Guy for providing the core of a fun project and learning experience that will become gifts for my two of my favorite cat lovers. So that's mysterious. You'll have to read in Discord about what that is. <laughs> thanks to Toddbot and MZO for a quick and thoughtful code review. Their discussion led to the expansion of my Python skills into a, pre into a previously undisclosed, undiscovered realm. And thanks to WSU's Jay Snyder et al. for the very practical Python course reference. Okay, next is Foamy Guy. Hey, thanks, Dan. Um, first uh, hug report is uh, for C. Grover, uh, for, who made some enhancements in the Nico Kitty animation uh, project that I worked on a little while back, including adding support to have multiple kitties running around of varying colors. I suspect this is probably what uh, the gift that Seagrover is talking about as well. Um, the next hug report I have is for Warrior of Wire uh, for offering some feedback and pointers on some plans and an attempt I made uh, at implementing the hidden um, property or, or the ability for vector IO shapes to be hidden within the core. Definitely appreciate uh, their insight. Um, to uh, Tammy Makes Things uh, for streaming on Twitch. I've caught a couple of Tammy streams in the last week or so, and there's, uh, it's great to see more uh, folks out on Twitch working on this kind of stuff. Um, and then uh, lastly to you, Dan, for and, uh, as well as everybody else who's contributed for keeping the, uh, the new releases uh, flowing, 7.2.4 and uh, the new beta as well. So thank you for that. Yeah, well, thank you, Foamy Guy. Okay, next up is Jeff. Hello. I wanted to start with a hug for Jerry. Uh, thanks for the bug reports. And you shouldn't necessarily be so meek about them because if the problem affects you, it may also be affecting 10 people who didn't mention it to us. And in particular, I mean this, um, I'm referring to this issue where with the newest version of the compiler on Mac OS, uh, MPY Cross wouldn't build. 
Uh, thanks to Katni for taking the time to catch up last week. A couple of thanks to you, Dan. Uh, one, for engaging me about issues and pull requests, and also for your funny April Fool's Day post last week. Okay, thank you, Jeff. That post is about circuitous Python, and I'll leave it for, to you to find it if you're interested. Okay, next, Jerry. Hi, it's the uh, group hug, dear buddy, from me. Thanks. Thank you, Jerry. Okay, uh, next is Katni. Hello. So I have a hug report to Eva for the excellent walkthrough and notes on doing an Adabot patch and for helping me run through running my first one on my own. To Jeff for stepping in when the patch failed entirely due to an issue with my Git setup. And it's a problem that Eva and I almost certainly would not have figured out. Um, and Jeff figured it out uh, very quickly. Um, to Tectric for a ton of work. Um, put into determining what needs to happen with the library infrastructure related files in cookie cutter and across the libraries to get them updated and in line with what they are supposed to be right now. Um, to Dan for publishing the latest releases to CircuitPython. Um, to Professor John Gallagher for a lovely discussion about how CircuitPython has worked out for him in higher education and spoiler, it wor it's working out great. Um, to Jeff for a lovely chat uh, last week. Also to Dan for writing a very thorough guide on async IO from which I was able to grab a lot of explanation for my template page and for reviewing my template code. And to Mark Gambler for helping explain async IO in a simplified manner as I was struggling to understand it and help it and providing feedback in something worth adding to the template and a group hug to everyone. Okay. Thank you, Katni. Okay. Next up is K Mitch. Oh, thanks, Dan. Uh, uh, a hug to Anik Data, uh, Jeff, and Dan, all three of y'all, for guidance on allocating memory on the ESP32 S3. And particularly, thanks for giving insights and help on even things that are on uh, long term milestones. So, thanks for, for spending some of your precious time on that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, next is uh, Melissa. Uh, hello. I wanted to give a hug report uh, to Baloop, uh, who for agreeing to maintain the web serial ESP tool. He's the founder of Nabucasa. Um, to Byte Evil for adding the Kadis Vem3 board to Blinka, uh, which brings us up to 88 boards now. And to you, Dan, for being helpful with Blinka and circuitpython.org. To Jeff for the uh, Pie Ladies auction ticket and group peg to everyone else. All right. Thank you, Melissa. Okay. Next is Mark Gambler. Oh, it says lurking. Group hug to everyone. Sorry. And um, Tammy makes things is out here. I'll read their contribution to group hug for everyone. And next is Tectric. Do you want me to read your Hi. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, thank you to Katni for the interesting project uh, for looking into the libraries, um, specifically the cookie cutter and the library, library patches. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, and I've really enjoyed it. Um, group, hug, or, uh, group hug, I guess, also. Um, a hug to Rimwolf Redux for the input on a MIDI-related PR. Uh, I'm pretty new to MIDI, so it was nice to get some some feedback uh, for someone who knew a little bit more than I did. Uh, to you, Dan, for the long-awaited circuitous Python release. Uh, big fan. And yeah, group hug. All right. Thank you very much. OK, so we're done with hug reports now, and we'll move on to status updates. Take another time code for the whole section, and then I'll start. So this is where. We just talk about what we we have been doing and what we plan to do coming up, related to Circuit Python, or what else if the, if you if you're busy doing something else. So I'll start uh, with the time code. I'm trying to type quietly, and I make a lot of typos that way. Um, I released Circuit Python 7.2.4 as mentioned uh, to support. Uh, the new version of the Adafruit Feather ESP32 board, um, and also support and also make it its use of uh, I2C power be compatible with the old version of the board. And I released CircuitPython 7.3.0 beta so that there's a latest for people to try that's much easier to point to. 
you can just go to circuitpython.org and find that one. Um, I'm still working on a fix for a problem with board.uart on RP2040 boards. This was a, uh, I have a fix for it, which is straightforward, but there's still a very odd problem about what have strange things happen when you connect your pins from that board to another unpowered board. I, I had a test set up and I was getting errors and I don't understand what it is, but it's probably not worth looking at in great detail right now because very strange things happen when you uh, have pins connected to unpowered boards. Sometimes you back power that board and it it can act oddly. So it may it may be something that is just a hardware problem. And the after I get that work that working, I'll be working on uh, issues with ESP32 SPI, especially on Matrix Portal. A lot of people are having problems with the um, their web their web setup like crashing after a relatively short period of time. I mean, you want to try to nail that down and figure out what's wrong. All right, next I'll read C. Grover's contributions. Where we go, can't type. Uh, C. Grover says, finish the multi-cat version of Foamy Guy's NecoCat project. It's compatible with Pi Portals and TFT Featherwings. The final version will become two GIFs, GIFTS using 2.4 TFT feather wings and pink RP2040 feathers. The challenge now is to install it in an appropriately creative enclosure. Suggestions are welcomed, except for anything looking like a litter box. Okay. When testing projects on the Pi Portal Titano, I noticed that the display brightness range wasn't similar to the other Pi Portals and TFT feather wing displays. The Titano's display brightness PWM signal is operating at a frequency which seems like 50 kilohertz, which is too high for the FAN 5333 backlight controller. The data sheet notes that a frequency above 1 kilohertz may cause a brightness nonlinearity. Tests on the 3.5 inch TFT feather wing, same display, same backlight controller, confirm that a PWM frequency of 500 hertz works best and restores the entire brightness range. We'll submit an issue for display I/O display for further testing, and there's a reference to an issue that uh, Seagrover put in their own repo. And I'll just note that I had some conversations with Seagrover about this, um, and he's going to do some audio testing about it too, just to, to make sure that injecting 500 hertz doesn't cause a 500 hertz spurious um, uh, signal or that you could hear. Okay, next up is Foamy Guy. All right, thanks, Dan. Um, so uh, today and a little bit yesterday, I've been catching back up on some PR reviews. I had a couple of weeks where I was spending a couple of nights a week teaching class, um, and so I had reduced time to kind of focus on CircuitPython stuff. But uh, that class has concluded, so now I'm getting back to more of my usual uh, schedule, which is nice. Um, I, on the deep dive, I think it was on Friday, I made an attempt to uh, implement the hidden functionality inside vector IO shapes. Um, and I got it partially working, but still needs to do some, uh, some more work in there to get it working in all cases. Um, I worked on uh, extending the page layout that I built last week to be used in a tab layout. That it, uh, This is like a helper class that allows the user to easily create tabbed pages with labels for each page. And the goal is that eventually there will be touch screen interaction as well. So you can touch on the tabs to change uh, between them. Uh, this week, I have been doing some thinking about, and I think I'm gonna take a, make an attempt at implementing a, a bitmap patch loader uh, is kind of what I'm thinking of it as or calling it. Um, this will basically use a, a relatively small sprite sheet along with some configuration details. And then it will um, have the ability to create a tile grid at an arbitrary size that uh, uses the corners of that small sprite sheet, but then repeats the tiles in the middle to achieve whatever larger size you want. Uh, this will allow us to keep our assets small, uh, but be able to build larger panels at runtime to display them on the screen. Um, the first kind of usage I have in mind for this is the actual visual tabs inside the tab layout that I'm working on, but I do, uh, do have a couple of other things in mind where I think this will be helpful as well. 
A um, couple other things I'm going to be getting into this week. Uh, I'd like to update the code in the Nico Kitty uh, project um, to use this new multicat version that C Grover has kindly uh, created and shared with us. Um, and then I'm also going to uh, dive in a bit to Adabot uh, some more. I took a look last week and didn't really find the exact part of it that I uh, needed, but uh, basically what I'm trying to do is figure out a way if we can make a draft indicator on the contributing page. So uh, PRs that are listed there will have like an extra little flag or something if they are marked in draft status. And I think Adabot is ultimately where that data comes from. Uh, so I'll be taking a, another look into that. Um, and that's what I have for this week. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Foley Guy. Okay. Uh, next, uh, it's Jeff's turn. Hello again. Um, just two short bullet points. Uh, last week, I think, I fixed the SAMD51 every three days bug, although I think that still needs to be merged. And this week, I already made good progress on several issues assigned to me in the core. Some of those PRs are failing to build, and I will scratch my head about that later after the meeting. I'm going to spend at least the first half of this week on CircuitPython before heading off on floppy stuff. And Friday is my yearly birthday, so I will be out uh, most of the day, at least in the afternoon, but maybe all day. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jeff. OK, next up is Jerry. Hi. Uh, so I spent a bunch of time last week playing with the um, ESP32 CT build, C3 builds, just trying to check out how they were working and had some interesting results. So if anybody else is trying them, just a heads up. Um, in order to use them, uh, in order to be able to write, since there's no US, no uh, circuit pi drive with those, in order to be able to write to them, I use a modified version of our shell um, that just use, uh, uh, accepts bin ASCII because the uh, the default version looks for ubin ASCII and it won't, won't run. So I, I put in a PR to fix that, but it's still pending. Um, also using screen to if when when that's not available just to check the REPL. So on the um, ESP32 C3 dev kit board, the expressive board, everything works great. Um, our shell connects. Um, I can talk to it. I can upload files. The REPL works fine, and and the, the little Wi-Fi test program worked just fine. Um, but so then I tried the QDPI ESP32 C3, and things just didn't work. So, uh, you know, that's what, what I really wanted to bring up um, in case anybody else has tried. I'm really curious if anybody else has tried this. So uh, our shell just couldn't connect to it at all. And I think the reason is because the REPL is just not working reliably. So when I went with screen to connect to REPL, I could connect, but it, your characters are missing. When you go to print out a format, it, like the uh, do a uh, dir, uh, help modules, you know, it normally prints out nice lined up columns. They were all erratic. Uh, cutting and pasting into the into the REPL didn't work very reliably. Things would get dropped, um, and so I think that's what's causing the, again the R shell problems. So I'm um, not sure what's going on there. Um, and then I tried doing a, just a manual import of Wi-Fi, and that just causes the board to just stop. And it just totally hangs. And in fact, the only way I can get it back was to power cycle it. Even a reset didn't work. So I don't know what's going on there either. <laughs> Um, so I, I created a couple of issues in the repository, and uh, again, if anybody else has had any experience with the Cutie Pie, uh, I just it'd be nice if someone else can um, verify that it's not just me. Um, I did try running MicroPython version 1.18, the ESP32 C3 USB build on the Cutie Pie, and it seemed to work okay. It took me a couple of tries to get it right, but it, it finally, once I reset it enough times, it, it actually seems to be working okay. So that's it. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Jerry. Okay. Uh, thank you very much also for working on the C3 because it's true, it's very early and it's really nice to have all these things lined up. It certainly seems like there's something wrong with both transmit and receive on the UART. USB, USB. Yeah, that's yeah. That, that's one of the questions. One of the you know, I was hesitant to put these in because I know it's early, very early on this board. So, but I figured since it's out there, I might as well start opening issue reports on it because it can, is it is there for people to download. So. Yeah, and we can look and see how whether why my why it works on MicroPython it doesn't work for us. That would be helpful. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, uh, Katni, you yes. can go ahead. 
Thanks, Dan. Um, apologies about the really, really long status update. <laughs> Um, so last week I ran my first Databot patch on my own. It took a bit to get through, but once we got through the bumpy parts, it went really well, applied to all the libraries, and fixed a major issue caused by a dependency of one of our CI files causing everything to fail. Um, basically, uh, dependency to black was updated in a way that, um, in a way that made black fail, unless you were running the absolute latest. So it was either we had to pin that dependency or um, update black, which made a lot more sense. So that was good. Got through a huge amount of miscellaneous that had been piling up for a bit here. It was mostly little things, but it was adding up quickly. Added a MicroPython setup page to the Feather ESP32 v2 guide. I met with Professor John Gallagher to talk about his experiences with CircuitPython in education for a talk I submitted to the Education Summit, which is a small get together before PyCon about Python in education. It hasn't been accepted, but I don't want to wait to the last minute to find out it was. If it's not, I'll at least have part of a talk put together. I wrote up an example using a button to control two NeoPixel rings using async IO for the async IO template. I mostly finished the async IO template after a lot of help. Thanks again to Dan and Mark. Um, I ran into issues with testing PyLeap, so I'll be looking into that this week. And Liz finished her first product guide late on Friday, so I'll proof that this week. So this week, uh, the first thing on my list is to proof Liz's guide so she can get that into moderation because she's, um, I think, now blocked on me. She may still be blocked on an um, Arduino issue. Um, I need to blog up the Feather v2 MicroPython setup guide page update. Um, I can cross off the look into why PyLeap testing isn't working properly because uh, apparently I needed to be added to the list specifically, um, which Trevor took care of. And so um, now I'm in the middle of updating uh, the iOS or the OS on my iPad uh, because the newest PyLeap requires the latest OS, I guess. Um, and then I need to get the GIFs for the async IO template. The plan is to upload them to GitHub and then add an extra template area in the guide page um, to say use one of these two depending on what your hardware setup is. Um, it There's two different hardware setups possible for the async IO template. One is a built-in button and the other is an external button. And I thought that it should at least match the wiring diagram. So there's really no way to include two separate ones depending on what is what. You have to make that decision when you fill in the template. Uh, the next thing on my list is to write up the guide for the Cutie Pie LiPo BFF. Um, sometime this week, uh, so this is a little bit out of order, verify the cookie cutter and patch PRs put together by Tectric and then go through the git ignore PR. Um, and then begin thinking about more projects to add to PyLeap, porting existing ones or coming up with new ones. And the <clears throat> thing I didn't mention about figuring out PyLeap testing is that I'm actually going to go through and test all of the recent additions to the PyLeap projects to make sure that everything that was added works for me. And that's what I have going on. All right. Thank you, Cadney. Cadney always has a lot going on and her contributions are tremendous. Thank you. All right, we'll go on to Kmatch. Uh, thanks, Dan. So continue working on using ESP32 S3's LCD peripheral, which can drive uh, fairly simplistic displays and trying to get that into CircuitPython. Uh, first thing I did was sort of fill out the file structure for a new module called dot clock display uh, that can use a frame buffer and use the ESP32 S3 uh, to drive this kind of display. Uh, and next thing was, as I mentioned, the HUG report, thanks to help from the team. Uh, I got it to allocate memory to draw into the frame buffer and attach that to the screen. Uh, so I drew my first pixels, so that was good. It is hard-coded in the constructor, but at least I saw something wiggle, so that's good. Uh, and this week, hope to get actually the CircuitPython code able to draw to the dot clock display. And if that works, REPL should be within reach, but we'll see if we can get that done this week. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. OK, next up, Maker Melissa. Hello. Uh, so this week, or last week rather, uh, I finished up the 1.47 inch and 1.9 inch display guides. Um, I updated the Raspberry Pi 4 TensorFlow guide, so it's working now. And I fixed Blinka to work with both older and newer versions of LibGPIOD. 
I tested out the ESP32C3 QDPI on the Web Serial ESP tool. I recorded a podcast on the CircuitPython show, and I added a bunch of new boards to CircuitPython.org, and I spoke with Nabucasa about maintaining the future updates on the Web Serial ESP tool. Uh, this week I'm working on updating guides to point to the Nabucasa version of the Web Serial ESP, Web Serial ESP tool. I'm taking a look at possible, um, a possible improved Raspberry Pi display driver, and I'm seeing what it uh, will take for what per snapper firmware up to to point to the NPM package for Web Serial ESP tool. And that's it. All right, thank you, Melissa. Okay, I'll read Mark Gambler. Um, Mark submitted the revised Zlib PR. Once it is acceptable, I can create an issue to track the possible improvements discussed in the current PR so they are documented, and if someone else wants to grab them, they can. Um, off on vacation Saturday for a few days to New York City, getting to try again for the vacation I had to cancel almost exactly this date in 2020. We all know about that. If anyone from the community is in New York City or around and wants to meet up for coffee, let me know on Discord. All right, next up, I'll read uh, Tammy Makes Things uh, submission. Uh, last week um, on Twitch, two Twitch streams last week, finished up for now my MacroPad MIDI project and began the implementation of <clears throat> a CircuitPython library to represent decks of cards with display I.O. support. Oh, I get hardly, we will see Solitaire. Okay, began uh, work on a fix for Emrealison's Piku tool to work properly with boards that have large flash, flash capacity. This week, planned Twitch streams went pl planned Twitch streams Wednesday at 5:30 p.m. Say that fast six times, uh, and 5:30 p.m. Uh, Pacific time and Sunday at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Schedule subject to change. I'm planning to continue work on my CircuitPython card deck library. Continuing to work on the Piku fixes. Super busy with work this week, last week at my current job, so likely time's constrained again this week. Okay, and that's Tammy Makes Things Thing uh, a contribution. Uh, Tectric, you can go ahead. Yeah, so this week I uh, worked on the proposed patch uh, to the libraries as well as the cookie cutter update, which um, is a uh, topic for In the Weeds. Uh, additionally, I've been adding more functionality to the tick stepper motor controller library I've been working on. Uh, on top of that, went through some PRs and issues, just trying to, to burn those down a little bit. Uh, I think earlier in the week, I had done some more type annotations, um, as well as put a few other things into place, like some protocols for LEDs uh, to make uh, typing for those libraries easier. I know they're used in a, in a few places, so that'll giving them a central location will be pretty nice. Uh, added a few other random updates to a few libraries. Uh, I noticed there were some missing dependencies, so nice to get those. Um, so uh, all the right libraries are downloaded on uh, installed from PyPI. Uh, and then on another note, uh, I registered for my first grad course. Uh, it's on microcontrollers and embedded systems. So thanks everyone here. I'm sure my mechanical grad advisor was very confused, but uh, something I wanted to do. So thanks everyone for that. Uh, this upcoming week, I'm um, going to continue working on the patch and the cookie cutter update um, with Katni and everyone here. Uh, additionally, going to I know there's a few more things to add for that tick stepper motor library uh, to get uh, a more thorough uh, functionality for it. Uh, there's a couple things I got to follow up on on some PRs like the portal base. Um, we do, we're looking at trying to add multiple Wi-Fi libraries, so. Um, thanks, Foamy Guy, belated uh, hug for the feedback on that. And starting to plan for PyCon this year. All right. Thank, thank you very much, Tectric, and thanks for your, all your work on the libraries. It's been tremendously helpful. So that wraps it up for uh, progress reports. We'll now move on to In the Weeds, where we have, this is for sort of long reform discussions that require more dialogue and uh, cogitation about things. And so Katni and Tetric have a kind of a multi-part thing here, and I, I'll turn it over to them. All right. So um, here's the basically what's going on with TechTrick had sort of touched on, um, is that I asked TechTrick to compare the CI type files, including .gitignore, across all of the libraries. 
as there are files that should be identical and it has become pretty clear that they are not. As well, we haven't been great about updating cookie cutter with all of the changes we've made to the library, so the newer libraries are missing out on some of the important updates. To that end, Tectric put together three PRs. All of them can be discussed, but I think the one that should involve the most discussion uh, is probably the .gitignore file. So the first PR is to cookie cutter for a .gitignore. Basically, it was determined that there were significant differences across the libraries in the .gitignore file. And uh, I, so I asked Tectric to pull together from all the libraries, every entry in all of the .gitignore files. And this turned out to be much bigger than expected. Uh, it is almost certainly worth some discussion. As well, I'd like to see it better organized with comments as headers, but neither Tectric nor I know enough about what's going on with some of these entries to do a solid job of organizing. So if anybody's up for that, please let us know. Um, so basically, this, this PR um, has the... Um, has everything that all the libraries have. Um, the thing is, some of this stuff shouldn't be in there <laughs> um, for any of the libraries in general. Um, others of it, I'm not, I don't have a clue why it would have been added or what would have led to its inclusion, um, et cetera. And so there, I haven't had a chance to go in and review it by, in detail. Dan already provided a, a bit of feedback on a couple of things that should be ignored. Um, or should not be ignored, rather, should not be in this file. Um, so if anybody has any thoughts on this, opinions, um, information, whatever, please feel free to review this PR. And you can do, if you go into the PR and you go to the files changed section, you can actually provide feedback on specific lines if you haven't previously reviewed. Obviously, if you have, I'm telling you something you already know. Um, but it's it's worth I, I want some feedback on this because it's something we're gonna backport into all the libraries once we have a settled idea of what we want in there. And I just I feel like other folks should have a say in what um, what goes in there. So that is uh, the sum up of that PR unless anybody has any opinions now they want to talk about. Um, I can cover the rest of what we, what I covered in the weeds here. I'm a broken record about this, but I just can't uh, stop myself. So here I okay. go. Um, I think the better way to deal with gitignore files is that the gitignore file would list anything that is created during the normal course of doing build steps that are included within the thing itself. So like if you uh, have a library that builds Sphinx documentation, you would ignore the, any of the files created by Sphinx because everybody who works on the library will create Sphinx files. It's just part of working with it. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, if there's a file that everybody who uses OS2 ends up creating in there, well, hardly anybody uses OS2. A, a very small minority of people do. And so adding that to the gitignore of every library um, is not a good way of going about it. And instead, that person who uses this particular environment can put it in their personal but system-wide gitignore file. And then they never have to worry about it in, in any project again. But that's so the distinction is between files that are created in the way that we expect everyone to work with the library, such as by running Sphinx, or by ways that only some people are going to interact with the library. For instance, one person uses IDEA, one person uses Vim, one person uses PyCharm. They each create different files. That person, each person can deal with that by adding that to their personal but system wide gitignore file rather than by putting them all in in a vast laundry list that no one really understands. But I, I think I've already put this point of view forward and we've decided that that's not what we're doing. So I'll try not to go through this spiel ever again in the future. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> I, you're, I, free, you're free to. I, I agree with that actually. I think, but I think we maybe we need a section in our Git guides about how to, maybe we already do, we don't. Creating your own global Gitignore file. 
We absolutely don't because every Git guide, every major Git guide that we've written is based on the one I wrote and that definitely wasn't included in the okay, one I wrote. So I, because it is true, like, yes, you, maybe you can cover a few things like tilde or something, but in general, it's, it's the responsibility of the person doing the editing or whatever to clean up their I own mean, things. So my only concern about that is that there are like four major IDEs that most folks use and not everybody understands Git, et cetera. Um, and I don't see why we can't include the mishmash of what, of, of, because there's only one file um, from each thing typically um, at the bottom of the Git ignore and call it good to at least um, help out the folks that are using um, these four major IDEs, I guess. Um, I mean, I mean I, that's fine. That is a very pragmatic approach. Um, I mm -hmm. think what we should not do in the future is take in an individual library a PR to change the Git ignore file. I if agree it is entirely. Or my environment creates uh, dot whatever files or my you know whatever it is. We should say thank you and kindly turn them down uh, when they're added. I I don't mind being pragmatic. I mind. The, the very long list that is tough to vet because it's so extensive. I agree. Um, and that's why I was absolutely blown away and immediately wanted this put into a draft, the PR for this, and um, wanted to discuss it because this is not, this is not good. Um, and I, none of the CI slash infrastructure files should be changed in individual PRs because something on your machine made a change. The only place that these should be changed is in cookie cutter. And that means like everybody needs to discuss that change at that point and decide, is it worth adding? And then it has to, we have to patch all the libraries because that's how this happened was that everybody who produced anything added it in whenever they produced it. And some of this stuff is ancient. So this has just been coming in since the beginning of these libraries, I think. And, and we just haven't ever pulled it all together. Um, so I think... I think what we'll do is actually um, keep this keep this PR as a draft so we can like look at it. But I think it makes the most sense to actually separately put together because the editing this is out of the question <laughs> um, to basically separately put together all the things that make sense and open a new PR um, and then make a decision off of uh, off of that. Uh, off the new PR to include whatever we need to include to to deal with our build stuff and then add in the four files that are typically generated by the four major um, IDEs that are used um, and then be done with it. And, and any updates to it have to happen through cookie cutter and have to go through a discussion. Kathy? Yeah? I, I had a thought about that. Why, why not have a base, base uh, get ignore that bel that belongs in every library just the way it is, and then have a way to put the, say at the end, at the very end of the uh, get ignore, a marker that's a marker, followed by whatever whatever per personal things they need for their their uh wor working locally so and there's then a just lop that and just basically lop that lop that off that's not really tenable there's a personal git ignore like there is a global git ignore that you can put on your computer that applies to everything you do with git um and that's what we're going to push folks to use if they have personal files that are being included and um, are showing up in their, you know, get status when they try to make a commit. Um, to have it do any kind of splitting and all that stuff is just, that's a lot of overhead. Um, okay. I just, I just it's just, that I, I guess I've been lucky so far in my tinkering not to have add, needed to add any extra stuff to the cookie cutter really. Yeah. Well, I mean, the problem is other people added a lot of stuff. Like, yeah, so so can... we're we're now dealing with 
the large list of things that were randomly added. Um, okay, I hope you have good luck with that. Because thank you. I think we will. I've seen, what, I've seen what kind of a mess things like that can do to do to what a, what should be a simple simple thing. So I will I will put together. Um, yeah, I've looked at at. I think I've looked at that before, Jeff. Um, at least something related to get ignore docs. Um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty technical language there. So we'd want to boil it down for, um, people who are less conversant than that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'll put together what I, th what I think is everything that we would normally generate. Um, and then the, the few extra files that I would like to include, and then I will tag CircuitPython librarians on that. So everybody who is a member of that uh, group can, um, can comment on that. And, and I don't see a reason not to wait until we have another meeting so that I can bring it up in the meeting in case there's anyone who doesn't, or who is not part of the CircuitPython librarians team can still take a look at it and add in or, you know, pull out something that they think shouldn't be there or think should be there. Um, and then we'll go from there. That's, that's what I'm thinking. Cause I, I don't want to ask anybody to edit this file and I certainly don't want to. So I'm going to go ahead and put together something new that fits what I think is right. And then bring it to everybody again, um, to have this conversation only much shorter. Does that sound good? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Kenny. Yeah, absolutely. This is why I wanted to bring this up. Um, because that was a, that was a bonkers file. Um, the next two PRs don't really need discussion that I know of, but I wanted to bring, bring it to people's attention that, um, the TSC, uh, 2007 is a very recent library. So it's using the latest cookie cutter. Um, so it was, this was an excellent idea on Tectrix part to, um, add everything to this library that should be added to cookie cutter to get it up to date. Um, with all the other libraries. And so that includes, um, it's, it's all infrastructure stuff. Like that's, that's what we're making changes to. Um, and it will, it will get everything in, in line. And then once that is settled, the next thing, which is the, uh, library to the BME 680, cause when we do patches, basically you submit a PR to a random library just to make sure that CI passes because otherwise you don't know whether the patch will pass CI. And if you're gonna if you're gonna submit it to all the libraries, you don't want to break all the libraries. Um, so this is like a first step to that. This is all the things that need to be patched across all the libraries because they're different. Um, so it's it's two two separate pieces to all of this. Um, I don't think those two really need much discussion, but um, if anyone is familiar with the, like super familiar with the library infrastructure, please take a look and leave a comment if you would like to about um, changes you think should be seen or shouldn't or whatever. Um, all of this is based on comparing the libraries across all of them and um, comparing cookie cutter and comparing new libraries to old libraries and so on and so forth. A lot of, a lot of effort went into this. Um, thanks again to Tectric. Uh, so those things will be handled um, separately. The cookie cutter thing will end up being a PR to cookie cutter and the patches have to be divided up so that they actually will apply to as many libraries as possible. Um, so that's the next step with those two things. Um, so I think, I think that's everything. Um, unless Tectric, do, do, is there anything else that I didn't cover here that you thought should be covered? No, I think I think that's pretty much everything. Yeah, for the for the gate ignore, I I ran it twice because I thought I was getting some garbage data. No, um, I don't think so. I, it, <laughs> it really is that big. Um, no, I, I I think that's everything. Um, yeah, uh, there there were a couple places. I think just the only thing I'll say is for the BME library. I think that um, if the BME library had it but it was a concern that maybe others didn't. I think I like added a comment. So if anyone does look at that, um, mm -hmm. just, just know that, that, that those added comments just kind of represent that. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, I think you touched on everything. Excellent. Um, 
Yeah, the only other thing I would say is that I think that the Pilot RC um, is different in a bunch of the libraries, and that isn't included in the proposed patch. Um, so it might be worth taking a look at those in a couple of other libraries, because it's possible the BME 680 happened to come up, you know, the same. Um, yeah, I, I can take a look at that. Um, I'll, 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 I'll double check my, my output and whatnot. Um, the mm -hmm. only thing I could possibly think of is that if we had patched it for all the things, but the, it, it may be a, a, a scenario where all of the libraries outside of cookie gutter are, are up to date and there's nothing that cookie cutter explicitly got that the libraries didn't is the only yeah. thing I can think of. And that's entirely possible. I just, I want to make sure that that's, that that's for sure. Um, before we move forward with patching, because if we need to patch that, I want that to be on the list. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll double check my uh, the output of my my scripts and just okay. make sure that that's the case. Or thank or you. Fix it otherwise. No problem. All right. Thank you. So that covers uh, our in the weeds topic, and um, that's the only topic you've got. So Dan, you are welcome okay. to do your thing. I'll, I'll just say I'll say one more thing, which is not mm -hmm. really part of this. We can defer it, but we also talked very briefly about eventually replacing setup.py with pyproject.toml. Yeah. That's a whole other project on itself, but it's yeah, in the, that'll in the be of this. Yeah. That'll be another patch. <laughs> yeah. So if anybody has has experience with pyproject.toml, uh, let us know uh, or make suggestions. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, that wraps up this meeting. We just ran just a little more, just about an hour. Um, I'll take a final time code. Uh, Next week's meeting is uh, same time, same channel, April 11th, 2 p.m. Uh, U.S. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. U.S. Pacific Time. Um, thanks to everybody who participated today. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, and those of us who work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. We will release a video of this meeting on youtube.com slash Adafruit. I'll be doing that later today and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. That happens mysteriously automatically. Um, it will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to the newsletter. So thank you very much, and we'll see everybody, talk to everybody next week. Thank, thank you, Dan. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. I'll stop. Thanks, everyone.